Hello and welcome back to Algebra, the video course where we talk about algebraic structures like groups and rings. And in today's part 10, we will talk about the concept of a subgroup. This notion is not hard to grasp at all, because we can just imagine one group embedded in another one. So here we can just take a group G together with a binary operation. And now the idea is that we are able to restrict this binary operation to a subset H. And then, most importantly, what we get is a group again. And since H is embedded in the larger group G, we call it a subgroup. And now before we go into the concrete definition, I can already give you a nice example of that. Just consider the real numbers with the addition, so this is our group G. And embedded there, we find the integers with the addition as well. Hence, Z inside R is a subgroup. And with that, you already have a rough idea what we will talk about today, namely, what are the properties of subgroups. And indeed, it's always possible to find subgroups in a given group, but sometimes these are not interesting at all. However, before we start with the actual definition and before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, with the link in the description, you can download additional material for all the videos. Okay, then I would say that we write down the definition of a subgroup. In fact, the ideas we have already mentioned before, we just need a fixed group G. In short, it just means that we have a set G together with a binary operation, which is associative, and we find an identity element and all the inverses. And then we just take a subset H in G, which is not the empty set. And now the special name we can give to this subset is subgroup of G. But of course, we do that only if H together with the binary operation forms a group again. So we have exactly the same binary operation, just restricted to fewer elements. So this means, restricted to the subset, the binary operation has to be well defined. But if we have that, then you also see we don't have to check all the properties of a group here. For example, the binary operation is associative on G, so it's also associative on H. But still, we have to check that we have an identity element in H and all the inverses. In fact, this is all we need, because then we know that the subset is actually a subgroup of G. So you see, showing that something is a subgroup is not so hard. And now we can immediately make the connection to the last video, namely, we can show that we have a group homomorphism here. This means we have a map phi, from H into G. And of course we have it in this direction, because H is usually smaller than G. And moreover, the definition is really simple, because we just have to send X to X again. In other words, we can just choose the identity map here. And then obviously we have the defining property of a group homomorphism, because the binary operation left and right here are the same. So nothing really happens here, we just have A with B on the left hand side and A with B on the right hand side. But still, we can use the general properties a group homomorphism gives us. So for example, from the last video, we know that the identity element is always sent to the identity element again. Hence, the neutral element EH is sent to EG. However, since the map phi does not do anything, we get that EH is equal to EG. In other words, we have already proven here that a subgroup has to have the same neutral element as the larger group around it. This was not clear from the beginning, but now it's a proven fact. Every subgroup has the same neutral element. Okay, and now as promised, let's write down how we can check for a subgroup in a group G. Obviously, we need the same assumptions, so we take a group G and a subset H which is non-empty. And then we get that H is a subgroup of G if and only if two conditions are satisfied. And only these two claims 
we actually have to check if we go into examples. First, if you take two arbitrary elements A and B from H and you combine it with the binary operation in G, then the result also lies in our subset H. So this tells us that we cannot leave the subset H with the binary operation. Combining two elements still leaves you inside H. And we get the same result if we want to use the inverse operation. So the inverse of A lies in H again if A comes from H in the first place. So we know we can form the inverses for all elements in G, so in particular the ones in H, but we cannot leave H just with the inverses. Okay, so now you see this whole thing makes our life simpler because checking a subgroup just means checking these two properties here. However, of course, we first have to prove this proposition now. And as always for equivalences, the proof consists of two implications. And let's start with the one from left to right. This means now we assume that the subset H already forms a group. So this implies the binary operation is well defined on H. So formally we can say we have two inputs coming from H and the output is in H again. Hence this already shows the first statement here because it claims exactly that, that the binary operation lands in H again. So let's call this first statement one star and this one is shown now. Moreover, please recall that we have already shown that the neutral element in H has to be the same as the one in G. And now you should see having the same identity element also implies having the same inverses. For example, you could say E is equal to X inverse with X. And this equation holds for every X in G. And most importantly, this inverse here is uniquely given. So there cannot be another element in G that satisfies this equation with X. Hence, if X comes from H, there's also only one inverse that satisfies this equation. However, we already know that H forms a group, so we know all the inverses are included, which means if X comes from H, X inverse also lies in H. And therefore, the second claim here is also done. Okay, maybe this was the simpler direction, so let's go to the other implication. So here we just assume that H is just a subset but the two properties star and two star are satisfied for it. And in the first step here, we can do the same as before, just in the other direction. So if we know that A with B lies in H for every A and B, the binary operation is well defined on H. This is very good because it's necessary, a group needs a binary operation, which is also associative. Indeed, this is the next step, it's associative, because it was already associative on G. So if we restrict the binary operation to fewer elements, we will not change the associativity. In other words, we can already say that H with the binary operation is a semigroup. Therefore, we only need to show that we have a neutral element and all the inverses inside H. And exactly for this step, we need that H is not the empty set because then we can definitely just pick an element in H. And then two star tells us that the inverse of A also lies in H. And then we can simply use one star again. It tells us that we are allowed to combine A with A inverse and the result lies in H. But by the definition of the group G, this is our identity element E. Hence we get that E also lies in H. And there we have it, we have a semigroup H which has an identity element and we also know that for each element there is an inverse which also lies in H. So our conclusion here is that H is a group and therefore a subgroup in G. So this is a very nice result and now I would say to close this video let's look at an example again. Maybe first let's discuss a very general example. If you take any group G, you can always write down at least one subgroup. 
namely just take the new two element E as a subset of G. Then this is definitely a subgroup of G because it satisfies the two rules from above. Indeed, it's the smallest possible group you can have. On the other hand, the largest possible subset in G you can choose would be G itself. And obviously G also satisfies the two properties from above, so it's also a subgroup of G. Hence, in the case that G has more than one element, you always find at least two subgroups in G. In other words, these are just the trivial subgroups we have. So most of the time, we are not interested in these. However, we can also look at a more concrete example here, so let's take the integers again. So also here we could ask, what are the possible subgroups in Z? And I can already tell you, we find a lot if we fix a natural number M. Because then we can define a subset we can call MZ, which is simply given as the multiples of M. So we have M times K, where K comes from Z. So obviously this is a nice non-empty subset in the integers. And moreover, it's also easy to check the two properties we have above. And therefore, for every M, this MZ is a subgroup in the integers. In other words, we immediately find infinitely many subgroups of the integers. And maybe here you can recall part 8, where we have discussed a very special group. There we consider the integers modulo m. And one possible notation we saw for this group was given by this quotient here. And there I can already tell you, this is a general concept where we divide a group by a subgroup. What this exactly means we will discuss soon, but what comes out is a group again. So you could say, by having a subgroup, we can also form new groups as well. Therefore, I would say, let's discuss in the next video what G divided by H actually means. So I really hope we meet there again, and have a nice day. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.